New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. You can now download a free PDF copy or purchase a beautiful printed edition of Issue 5 of the New Thinking Aloud magazine. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we will be exploring universal consciousness and the brain. My guest is Dr. Alexander Escobar, who is an associate professor in biology at Emory University. He has been developing the quantized visual awareness model as an explanation for visual consciousness, and he is the author of Universal Consciousness, a Scientific Exploration. Alexander is based in the Atlanta, Georgia area, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Alexander. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to talk today about universal consciousness. It's actually one of my favorite topics. I've been doing these interviews for half a century, and universal consciousness, when it comes up, always seems to be a high point of, of all of the discussions. So today we're beginning with a, a topic that often only comes up at the end of, of many other interviews, but in a way you regard it as a starting point for your work. And I suppose if I had to define universal consciousness in a nutshell, I, I would say the whole universe is conscious. That's correct. Yes, I, I believe that there is a conscious, subtle form of consciousness that exists throughout the universe. And uh, in my work, I, I place that in electromagnetic fields. Now, that just might be a starting point, right? It, it could be expanded in the future. But given uh, my experience with uh, the brain and how it works and the parts of the brain that might hold consciousness, I think that the electromagnetic fields are a great place to start. Certainly. The brain is an electromagnetic organ. I don't think there's any question about that. Right. So, you know, there are basically three different candidates that we could look at when thinking about consciousness being produced by the brain, uh, one of them being the material uh, parts of the brain, so the cells and the molecules that contribute to those cells. Uh, we also have the currents that are running through all the neural circuits. And then also the electromagnetic fields that are being produced from those currents. So those are the three candidates for uh, a physical surrogate to consciousness. And it's my belief that it's the electromagnetic fields for two reasons. The first being that the electromagnetic is, uh, field is dynamic. It's constantly changing and that correlates well with our conscious experience. We have a constantly changing uh, conscious experience with different colors and different sounds, etc. And the other piece to this is that the electromagnetic field receives information from the entire brain. So it's a, it's a quick way to communicate information from a specific location in the brain to the entire system, right? It goes out and becomes whatever uh, part of the brain's becoming active, uh, will communicate its information to the rest of the information that the brain's producing. Well, I like the idea of the electromagnetic field, and I know we're going to get into it in greater depth, but I am a little surprised you didn't mention all of the literature now that has come out about the uh, quantum level and how that impacts the brain. Right, and and it could be the case that, that what I'm talking about is actually a quantum level uh, effect, right? Uh, I'm specifically talking about electromagnetic fields and the photons that populate those fields. So we're talking about the quantum world. Uh, I'm just talking about it in maybe a larger way that a lot of more people can, can relate to. Um, the quantum mechanics is very mathematically based and a lot of people get lost in those details. So I'm trying to keep it at the level of uh, thinking about electromagnetic fields. 
As you point out, the photon is the basis of electromagnetic fields. Photons, unlike a lot of uh, the other types of matter that we're familiar with, don't have any mass associated with them. So they're massless particles and also waves. This is a very strange aspect of photons. They're both waves and particles. Um, and uh, it's that uh, massless, uh, pure energy form that can achieve light speed, right? Nothing else in the universe, uh, according to our current theories, can achieve that light speed. It's, all, it's only the photons that can go that fast, and that has important consequences for the thinking behind them being our conscious uh, surrogates. Now, your normal research involves visual information processing. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And, and a big part of that is that it's the part of the brain in terms of experience that's been studied most extensively. So we know a lot about the circuits that are involved in producing our conscious, our visual conscious experience. Uh, there are centers that have been identified like V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. There's the ITC. There are a lot of different centers and the connectivity between those centers is well studied. Uh, there's a lot known about the anatomy and that's an important part of uh, my research and, and my thinking about how all this comes together. And so it's a great place to, to start, but one of the important points that I want to make is that the ideas that are, that are being developed around our visual uh, cortex are, I believe, applicable to all our other cortices in, in terms of the experiences like, you know, auditory or gustatory, or whatever other kinds of experiences we might have. It's pretty uh, standard ideology in biology and in the neurosciences in general that consciousness is a product of the brain, that the brain produces consciousness. And as I read through your book, I, I didn't get the impression you disagreed with that exactly, but I didn't either get the impression that you agreed. Yes, that's a great point. The, the idea is that the brain is shaping consciousness. So the basic underlying belief is that consciousness is embedded in electromagnetic fields, both inside and outside of the brain. But the brain, because it's of its specific structure and its specific circuitry, shapes that conscious, that subtle form of consciousness into specific instances that are called qualia. And these qualia can vary. You can have red, uh, let's say a dot of red color or a dot of green color, right? You, you can imagine different forms. Uh, so uh, the metaphor that I like to use is to think about a potter with clay. So clay is formless, right? It doesn't have any specific shapes, but a potter can take that and shape it into a specific uh, manifestation. And so that is what I believe these circuits are doing in our brain. But the clay itself, or, or consciousness itself, existed, I gather, in, in your worldview, prior to the brain. That's right. It's embedded in all electromagnetic fields and uh, electromagnetic radiation. So it's a property of the universe, and in my mind, it's as fundamental as gravity. So it's, it's built in or baked into the universe, and evolution has used this uh, quality of the universe to help uh, organisms achieve reproductive success. That's the term that we use in biology, right? So to become successful and to be able to survive, just like any other uh, physical kind of process that you can imagine, like um, diffusion is something that our bodies use, and that's a basic principle of the universe. So the, the biology just uses what's already there. I have to admit, when I first encountered your emphasis on the electromagnetic properties of the brain, my instinct was, was to feel that can't be right, because as a parapsychologist, theirs is an expression that we have, and it goes back to the 1970s. Uh, I call it electromagnetic chauvinism, and it, it dates back to a time when researchers, uh, I was a researcher, a mathematician in England who got named John King, if I remember correctly, got very interested in parapsychology. And then he said, well, it can't work because parapsychologists are proposing that information can be received uh, independent of space or time over thousands of miles distance, whereas electromagnetic waves 
fall off with the uh, square root of the distance, as I recall, or, or the square of, of, of the distance. The, the further you are from the origin of the signal, the weaker it gets. But extrasensory perception doesn't seem to work that way. And he said, because it can't be explained by electromagnetism, therefore it doesn't exist. And I gather, though, that you have a completely different viewpoint around that. Well, let me just say that that he was right about the strength of electromagnetic fields. I, I doubt that we can push our fields out too far beyond our own craniums. That it's a it's a nice little barrier. Uh, so yes, uh, that information can't be uh, being sent through our through our craniums and out into the world. So what's the mechanism for communicating information? And in in the book uh, that I've written, what I talk about is that. Uh, electromagnetism, uh, photons, electromagnetic radiation exist in a unique state that was described by Einstein. So Einstein's special relativity uh, theory talks about how light, uh, traveling at light speed exists in a timeless and spaceless state. And this applies to all electromagnetic radiation throughout the universe. So we're talking about something pretty big here, right? All of the electromagnetic radiation throughout the universe exists in the same state. What I postulate in the book, what I describe and try to explain is that, uh, that, that, uh, those states are not separate. We, we think of them as being, you know, related to each individual photon, let's say. But I believe that it's just one state. And if that's the case, then all of these photons come together into that one state. All consciousness associated with those uh, photons also comes together into this one state. And it's that central location that allows us to communicate with each other because we're all connected to that same state. Would I be incorrect if I were to suggest that you're saying that in effect there's only one photon and it's everywhere? That's that's right. It's, it's kind of like that, but I'd like to expand on that and say that um, that each photon is connected to every other photon through what's called quantum entanglement. So each photon experiences itself, if, if you could imagine a photon experiencing itself, but also all other photons at the same time. And all of their paths, etc., would be included in that information that the photon experiences. So the, the implication for human beings is, is that we're all interconnected, not only with each other, but with, with all other sentient life anywhere in the universe. That's right. That would be the, the ramification of these ideas is that there's a direct connection between our mental states and the mental states of others. And so uh, the way that I like to think about this is that we're not communicating with each other, but maybe... Um, realizing larger parts of this uh, centralized state, this state that includes all that information. We're able to expand past the parts that we normally associate with ourselves into parts that maybe we might consider to be somebody else. That would be telepathy, right? Or maybe uh, a part that we consider to be our future selves. That would be uh, another form of clairvoyance, right? So, or, or uh, ESP. So that's the idea is that we're just expanding our awareness within this one state. So I, I guess to make things clear for our viewers, even though you are a professor of biology, you accept the data of parapsychology, of, of clairvoyance, telepathy, out-of-body experience, near-death experience. And if I recall correctly, you even refer to the data on reincarnation in your book. Right. And, and, I, and I don't want anybody to think that I... I am anything but a natural scientist. I believe that at the heart of all knowledge is experience. And I believe there's lots of experience out there. If you just go out and look for it, that relates to all of these phenomena. Like, for example, uh, you know, uh, psi abilities, et cetera. There are a lot of people that have these kinds of experiences. In fact, I've interacted with many of them that have told me about their experiences. It's like, unfortunately, here in science nowadays, we're disregarding this vast amount of data that's out there that uh, has been tested very rigorously by major uh, research projects and institutions here in the United States and throughout the world. There, there's lots of data that supports this. This is not uh, anecdotal in any way. Of course, I agree with you on that point, but it does seem to me that there's 
uh, still something of a, a, a mystery involved. If we're all connected to this universal consciousness, which I accept that uh, completely, how is it that a remote viewer is able to focus on a particular target out of all of the trillions of possible targets and, and pull in information ab about only the one that is needed? So this, this is an interesting question, and I think it relates to what a, a lot of folks that have had NDEs talk about, which is that you can focus on a specific location or person, and all of a sudden you're there. Some, there's some kind of built-in mechanism in this overall system that allows you to target specific instances that you're trying to connect with. And I'm not sure what that is or how that works, but it's something that's been discussed by many individuals that have had near-death experiences. So it's still a mystery to be explored. Exactly. There's there's so much to study here, in my opinion. I think that this is a door that's opening for science, for modern science. I, I believe that in the next century, this this will be the, the place that science kind of expands into in the same way that it expanded into, uh, you know, quantum mechanics and, you know, DNA and the use of DNA, et cetera, in the 20th century. This is our new uh, frontier, right? We're going to be able to expand, expand in ways that we, we don't, you can't even imagine right now. And this is going to be a wonderful thing for science and society in general, I believe. Well, in, in addition to the mystery of how a talented psychic or remote viewer can find a particular target at a distant location in time or space, there is uh, the, the opposite question of how come most of us don't experience universal consciousness at all. We go about our lives sort of focused on the necessities of survival and our ego needs. Right. So, uh, you know, there are lots of stories of people having these like spontaneous experiences that weren't necessarily looking for them. But it seems to me from what I've read and what I've learned that there's there's a uh, an increase in the chance of connecting with this consciousness if you train yourself, like, for example, through medi meditative techniques to quiet the mind. And the way that I like to think about that is um, think of yourself in a field, a beautiful field full of flowers on a bright, sunny day, and you're looking up at the sky and it's blue, right? And you're sitting there for hours, the sun begins to set, it finally sets. And as the sun sets and the, the sky darkens, you begin to see all the stars in the entire universe and you realize that the sky was actually a very close boundary and it wasn't even real, right? It, it goes away and you can see the entire universe right in front of you. I think it's it's the same thing. When you meditate, you're somehow able to quiet the mind in a way that lets you see the entire universe. Since you brought up meditation, I think it would be useful for our viewers to know that you've been engaged in, I gather, a project sponsored by Emory University to communicate with the Tibetan people. That's right. I, I was fortunate enough to participate in the Emory Tibet Science Initiative for about 11, 12 years. We were sending uh, scientists out to India to meet with the Tibetan Buddhist monks in the monasteries that are in India. And the reason why is the Dalai Lama wanted to insert science, modern science, into the curriculum for the Buddhists. So we taught them neurobiology, we taught them biology, and we also taught them physics. And uh, it's expanded now to the point where the monks have taken over the teaching and they're teaching other monks all of this modern science. It's an incredible change in their system. And I, I feel, I can't express how fortunate I feel because not only did I learn uh through these inter interactions, but I, I feel like I was exposed to a culture of peace and uh, compassion that I just have never found anywhere else. It was a beautiful experience. And, and so many of the paranormal experiences that are rejected by your scientific colleagues seem second nature to these Tibetan monks, I imagine. Th that's right. And, and I think the key here is to understand that the Tibetan monks are, and, and other Buddhists are using the brain as a scientific instrument. It's a scientific instrument that's being used to explore consciousness, not only within, but without, uh, outside of the brain, right? So, uh, the, the brain is the most sophisticated, more, most complex instrument that we know of. It surpasses any kind of machine that we can design here in the West. So 
I have no problem accepting it as a as a, an incredible instrument to study reality. Alexander, let's go back to the photon and uh, talk about. You mentioned that the photon exists outside of time and space, which it seems like a um, counterintuitive statement in a way because we measure them in time and space. But uh, let's go into Einstein's theories more so that if our viewers have any difficulty grasping that concept, we can help to make it more clear. Sure. So um, it, it's, a, it's a conundrum. It is a mystery that photons exist in, in these two states. So they are both a, a particle and a wave, right? So that's one of the ways that you can think of them in two ways. They are also existent in our universe. We can see them or we can uh, contemplate them projecting through our universe, but they also exist in this timeless and spaceless state that I was describing. And this comes directly out of Einstein's uh, special relativity equations. Uh, it, it, it's the case that as you go faster and faster, your your frame slows down. Time actually slows down. That's called time dilation. And uh, you also get uh, squished, right? Your dimension through which you're traveling shrinks, and that's called Lorentzian contraction. Well, uh, you basically end up in a timeless, spaceless state as you reach the speed of light. Now, that applies to all light, and the the that's been known for decades, right? It's been known since Einstein discussed this many years ago. But the, the piece that uh, I think helps us understand this on a higher level is that all of those timeless and spaceless states must be coming together into one state. There is a state that is described by science and it's well known, and that's the singularity at the beginning of the universe we know was a timeless and spaceless state. How do we know that? Because it's been described as the beginning of space and time, as that Big Bang event occurred time and space was created. So that means that previous to that, it was spaceless and timeless, right? That, that's what that singularity uh, indicates. So we know that that's possible, that you could have this timeless, spaceless state. And in the book, I, I actually say that all light comes together and that that singularity that's created by light and the singularity at the beginning of the universe are actually one and the same. Well, there are some paradoxes associated with the speed of light. It's very different than Superman traveling faster than a speeding bullet, for for example, that the speed of light is invariant no matter how fast I'm moving. If If I'm moving at the speed of light, trying to chase another photon, it will be moving away from me at the speed of light, even though I'm already going at that speed. That's right. That's that was one of the main predictions of Einstein's uh, theory, and so uh, the the reason, part of the reason that that is the case, is that uh, space and time are are being warped as you go faster and faster. And so, yes, you can never make any headway against any uh, other photon or a photon that you're trying to ca catch up to. It, it's not possible. And that suggests that, for example, if I were hypothetically able to travel on a photon. I think this was Einstein's thought experiment. If, if I was traveling uh, across the universe from one end of the universe to another on, on a photon and I had a watch, the watch wouldn't move. It would take zero amount of time to travel across the universe, but to an independent observer, it could take billions of years. That, that's correct. And, and, and let me take it a step further. So there's a symmetry here that's very important. In physics, uh, it's equivalent to say that I'm traveling down a street at, let's say, 60 kilometers an hour, or that the, the, let's say the trees that are on the side of the street are passing me at 60 kilometers an hour in the opposite direction. Those two uh, statements are equivalent. So that's what I mean by symmetry. So in this case, we could say that the photon is the observer watching the universe pass it at light speed because it's traveling, right? So the idea there is that then the whole universe shrinks down, right? Because the same principles would apply to the universe now and the light would be traveling through no distance, right? Because the dimension would shrink down to zero. Now, I want to say this is a significant statement. The entire universe through the, through which the photon is traveling has zero uh, distance in terms of 
the direction that it's traveling in, right? So uh, this then leads us to the point that light is taking no time to travel no distance, which means, which makes sense to me, right? It's taking no time to travel no distance, and it exists in a constant state of here and now. That's all the photon experiences is here and now. Which might be another definition of universal consciousness. Right, exactly. I, I believe that all of this comes together into that state of here and now, and that would include all past, presents, and futures, right? All of it in one large here and now. Would you say that that implies that our notions of space and time are to a certain extent an illusion? Oh, I, I, I totally agree with that. We, there's no doubt in my mind that our sense of size is, is a, is created by our conscious experience. And so uh, it's defined by the conscious experience. I, I don't believe that, um, these are absolutes, right? The, the way that we think of, you know, size. In fact, this is uh, highlighted in Einstein's theory. So the idea that you're traveling uh, at, let's say, close to the speed of light, your dimension has shrunk down. So in reality, now to an external observer, you're about three, you're about half as large as you were initially. But to the individual within the speeding rocket, let's say, it would appear as if they were the same size, as if nothing had changed. Uh, everything would be exactly the same as as before they began the experiment. So. Yes, I believe this is uh, this is a truism. It's a very uh, profound and yet counterintuitive thought. Most people will have a hard time grasping the idea that that space and time are 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 not exactly what we perceive them to be because we're so deeply embedded in space and time from certainly from the ego perspective. Right. So this is a, a big topic, and we could easily spend a whole nother hour talking about this. I teach a class on perception here at Emory, and in this class, we talk about how uh, your experience is shaped by the brain, right? For example, color is something that doesn't exist outside of our experience. It's something that's being created in our brain. Electromagnetic radiation, which is light, um, doesn't have a color associated with it. It's after that information gets to our brain that we see red, blue, green, etc. So the, the universe outside of ourselves is very different than what we perceive it to be. So really what we know best is our personal experience of the universe. And that includes things like uh, size or, or distance and time and the way that we perceive those characteristics of the universe. Another concept that seems central to your work you refer to it in, in terms of Surratt, the great pointillist artist of the early 20th century. But, but the uh, lesson there is, is that, the, I guess the way I would put it is they're hierarchies. We have molecules that are made up of atoms and cells that are made up of molecules and organs that are made out of cells and populations. And, and you go on to suggest that uh, it, it can get larger and larger uh, up to the very universe itself. Right. So we tend to put ourselves at the top of the ladder, right? We think of ourselves as complete organisms that, you know, are the manifestation of all those lower levels that we never stop to think about the possibility that we might be actually halfway up the ladder. <laughs> we actually might be, you know, not close to the top. Uh, what would that look like? Well, one of the things that I talk about in my book is this uh, great idea that was proposed by uh, uh, Lovelock uh, about 20 or 30 years ago. I don't know if you, you had a chance to talk to him or not. He was a, a scientist who believed that there is a uh, uh, a larger organism that we're participating in that he called the Gaia, Gaia hypothesis. This is the idea that there's a larger physiology that we're all participating in. And so that biosphere that we're all part of is actually a living organism. And so that's something that would never enter the mind of, of, an, of an individual who's walking around doing their thing, right? That they might be part of a larger organism. Well, uh, maybe it's also true that we're part of a, a larger conscious form, and we just don't realize it in the same way that if I could take you into your brain and have you talk to a neuron, it may not even know that it's part of a larger brain, right? It, it just does what it does. But we're actually perhaps contributing to something larger in the same way that the neurons are contributing to something larger in your brain. And um, it's so big that we can't see it. 
I, I think that would be the best way to think about it. It's so big that we can't can't see it. I do recall there were photographs published by NASA of uh, models of the entire universe, the structure of all the galaxies and uh, clusters of galaxies and so on. And people remark, gee, this looks uh, very much like the structure of neurons in the brain. Who's to say, right? It could be, it could be that we might be in a, in a universal consciousness, a universal mind, right? Um, it, I believe we are. And uh, the thing that we need to do is just take off the blinders and look around and, and see that maybe the story is a lot larger than we thought it was. Th this, to my mind, is very much like uh, Copernicus, who came up with the, or not him alone, but came up with the idea that the sun is at the center of our solar system. For thousands of years, people thought the Earth was at the center, and as a result, all these observations didn't make sense, right? Why were the planets moving in the way they moved? It didn't make sense. But once you place the sun at the center of the solar system, all the pieces fit. And I think that's what we're talking about here. If we can just readjust the way that we're looking at things, all the pieces fit and make sense. Well, it seems to me that the implication of your work is, is that we are not what the philosopher Alan Watts used to call uh, skin encapsulated egos. That's, that's not really who we are. We're interconnected with each other. And, but we go through our life very often with, with a sort of dualistic mentality. Like there are other people out there who are so different from me I, that I despise them, that I hate them, that I, I wish they would go away. But if you come to the realization that no matter how offensive their behavior may be to you, we are somehow connected with them, united with them, that at a, at a deep level of consciousness or of spirit, we are connected with them, then it would seem to me that we, there's no way we can engage in uh, loving ourselves without loving these other people at the same time, people who we would normally hate. That's right. And, and I think that is the the biggest benefit to humanity that could come out of this kind of a discussion that we're having is the realization that we are connected and uh, it's impossible to treat uh, other parts of yourself uh, in an inappropriate way. Like, for example, nobody thinks about being mean to their hand or their arm, right? It's like it's part of you. You, you can't mistreat yourself, you wouldn't think. And so, um, yeah, it makes sense that uh, that if you get a, a deep, and I'm talking about a deep, heartfelt understanding of this, these concepts that we're talking about, then it'll change your perspective on how you relate to everyone else. And, and not that, but the nature that's around you and the universe, everything changes if you can dive deeply into this, into this idea. You also, in, in, in the final chapter of your book, refer to a, a concept I've read of in esoteric literature. I think you use the phrase, the great I am. A sense of existence, right? Experience uh, in its most, um, I think, basic form is the great I am. It, it's I exist, I am, right? And that's a universal I am. It's not a, a local I am. Uh, it's a It's an I am that goes... Uh, deep into the past and far into the future. Uh, it includes the entire universe. It's, it's a profound kind of way of thinking about, um, existence, right? It, it, it exists. It is here and now and throughout. Back to the brain uh, for a moment. I'm under the impression that when we think of the operation of the brain, there are two things going on. One is information processing, not so different than what a computer might be able to do. I mean, computers are now very good at visual recognition. They do facial recognition, but I think pretty much everyone would agree these computers are not conscious, and yet maybe someday in the future they will be, but nobody, to my knowledge, uh, is seriously claiming that a facial recognition system which operates on algorithms is conscious. But but we know in from our own experience, the very fact that we are having experience means that we are conscious. So consciousness seems to me to be different than information processing. Would you agree? 
I, I would totally agree with that. And um, I, I think this ties into this um, big theory that's out there right now that's called integrated information theory. That is this idea that information itself is somehow conscious. And, and I, as a biologist, have a difficult time uh, getting my arms around that because in nature, it is true that information does exist, but it's always manifesting as either structure or an electrochemical gradient. And it's not an abstract concept, right? It's, it's a real thing. So uh, I think that part of the reason that this uh, idea has caught on and has become so popular is that it can be applied to computers because if you can think of information as in an abstract way, yes, computers have that, you know, that information uh, storage ability, information handling ability. Uh, but I, I don't believe that, uh, that computers are in any way conscious or have a subjective experience. And in, in the book and in, in papers that I've written, I talk about how I believe that, uh, the, important piece here is having these micro circuits that we find, for example, in the back of our brain that are shaping uh, electromagnetic fields in specific ways. And that's what creates the subjective experience of, let's say, a little bit of red or a little bit of blue. I, be I believe it's the specific shapes. Now, that's not to say that in the future we may not be able to to reproduce that, right? In a, in a little uh, form, create a little circuit that creates that kind of uh, electromagnetic field. I think that might be possible in the future. But before we do that, I think we need to uh, really think about why we want to do these things, right? Why do we want to recreate consciousness? This may be something that uh, has some very deep moral and ethical ramifications. I mean, if we could build uh, conscious androids like Data in, in Star Trek, uh, how will that change our civilization? Right, exactly. It, it, would, it would be... Uh, you know, it would be a, a very big thing to take on. Uh, uh, in my mind, it's kind of like having a child, right? You 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 have a responsibility for that child, this human that you've brought into the into this world. Well, if you're going to create consciousness, I think there's going to be a similar relationship with that uh, form of consciousness. But you're suggesting, if I understand it correctly. We don't create consciousness. So the human organism has developed ways to tap into a, this universal consciousness, which pre-existed us. That's right. We're not we're not creating it. We're just shaping it. And and maybe I'm I'm using the wrong term. Uh, we're shaping consciousness, and it's not just us, right? It's uh, found in many different animals, I believe, uh, and in a very subtle form in in other types of organisms and plants, etc. I believe that at the very least, there's this subtle form of consciousness that exists in plants and throughout. Uh, the, the big difference is that uh, our brains are able to shape these conscious fields into specific forms and inanimate objects and other types of uh, matter, that's not happening. So you're not getting this like specific shaping that I'm talking about that occurs in our brains. Well, in terms of any sort of practical technology, do you think the the work you're doing in the area of universal consciousness has uh, ramifications for future technology of any kind? Yeah, without a doubt. If we're able to understand the, the bits uh, that are creating, let's say, our visual experience, you should be able to recreate those perhaps in the brain of somebody that's blind, right? You might be able to recreate them or um, uh, maybe... You know, uh, same thing with auditory or what, what other uh, kinds of whatever kinds of uh, sensory experiences you can imagine. Right. You should be able to uh, amplify or somehow uh, enhance that in a brain uh, of somebody maybe that is lacking those those uh, abilities. Now, let me ask you an, another question as a university professor open to all of these ideas. How, how do your colleagues? respond to this sort of thing? I'm under the impression that many of the ideas you're dealing with are relatively taboo still in academia. Yes, they, they are taboo. And, and you know, this is the way that science is supposed to work, right? It's like, it's skeptical. And so whenever you bring a new idea into the, into the mix, into the, into the game, it gets questioned and people have a lot of resistance, etc. But it's only through coming back to these ideas. And, and I think that reality forces us to do this, right? We have to come back to the same things because it's part of reality. Uh, uh, these ideas that I'm talking about, you could find being thought of 
hundreds of years ago by some individual. So um, it, it's it's going to eventually force science to come back to this point of of really looking at these ideas in a serious way and, and considering them uh, as maybe part of the way that the fabric of reality works, right? So uh, I didn't. I don't expect people to just jump on the bandwagon. That's just not going to happen because that's not the way science is is set up. <laughs> In the Emory University Tibet program, I, I gather that many other scientists went over to India to meet with the geshes, the most advanced scholars in the Tibetan tradition there in India. Do you think that that exchange ha had an impact? I imagine it did on you personally. And how about your other colleagues as well? I, I believe so. I, I believe it changed their ideas about, um, well, a lot of things, perhaps the fabric of reality, but Actually, the way uh, uh, of interacting with others, since you know the Tibetan Buddhist tradition uh, has a lot about compassion and being kind to others, uh, that's something that kind of through osmosis you just pick up on being in that environment. Uh, also, another thing that that is precious in my opinion is the way that uh, the Tibetan system works. Is you're supposed to debate concepts, and so these monks will uh, you know debate these philosophical points and they'll end the, the conversation by doing the slap on the hands and they get very animated and it can be a very rigorous debate. But at the end of this, they uh, come together, they hug, right? And it was uh, a process of learning from each other and there's no anger or, or any of that. It's all about helping each other learn, right? And I think that's something that our educational system could benefit from. You know, we seem to be living in a uh, moment in culture where hostility and anger and nastiness is, is coming more and more to the surface. I hope that something good comes out of it at the end of the day. Well, I I'm hoping uh, that these kinds of conversations that we're having are going to start to seep into the culture and start making a difference because in my mind, this is what's needed, right? It's, it's a larger perspective that you get from diving deep into these ideas, I, I think that this is what the world needs, is a, is a kind of a, a reset in, in its way of seeing each other and seeing nature and seeing the universe. Alexander, we've been talking about the brain and we've been talking about a universal consciousness that exists outside of space and time, or, or maybe even outside isn't the right word, but independent of space and time. Somehow, how does that jive with the brain itself as a, a physical object that has dimensionality in both space and time? So this relates back to uh, the ideas of Einstein that I was discussing, the, the kind of dual nature of light in that it exists both here in, in, in this universe, but also in the state of timeless and spacelessness, right? So it's both at the same time, and it's hard for us to get our brains around that because we usually think of things as being one thing, but it's it's built into the structure of the universe that that light and electromagnetic radiation is both at the same time. And so we need to kind of allow for that, let the doors open enough for us to allow for uh, that to be the case. It, it, I mean, it's it's clear within the science and the, the formulations that were put out by uh, Einstein, that that is the case. But uh, I think the population in general needs to look at that and think about the possibility that that could be true. Um, it, 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 it is like opening, uh, it's like existing in a little shack all your life and then opening the door and realizing that you're sitting in the middle of a beautiful field full of flowers, right? And you go outside and you go, I never knew this was here. Well, this is what we're talking about. Sort of like coming out of Plato's cave. Exactly. That's it. Well, you, you know, I had a mentor many years ago when I was a student, Arthur M. Young, who wrote a book called The Reflexive Universe. And in that book, it's an elegant book, I highly recommend it. 
He equates light with spirit. And I know many critics felt that, oh, that's way too physical. You're create, equating spirit with a photon. And uh, surely spirit is much larger than the photon. But I get the impression that you might agree with him on that point. Yes, I do. I do agree on it. Uh, and I think that maybe some of the hesitation that we find might be due to that naughty Descartes, right? Descartes separate the two. They're not connected. And, and also the belief that the material can't be, um, special, right? It's just the material, but, but it is special, right? If you can step back and think about reality in, in at the level that we know, uh, in science today, it's mind boggling. It really is uh, amazing. And it's even more special than we know. That, that is the perspective that I have. Well, Alexander Escobar, I'm delighted to have had this conversation with you. I think that you're a, a significant pioneer in, in the field of consciousness. Your ideas uh, resonate strongly with me because they're very much akin to ideas I've began to think about 50 years ago under the tutelage of Arthur Young. So, uh, thank you so much for being with me today. It's been my pleasure, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this will be the first of many conversations that we might be able to have in the future. Well, I'll be watching your work closely, Alexander. So, once again, thank you. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us, because you are the reason that we are here. Book two in the New Thinking Aloud Dialogues book series is a tribute to parapsychologist Russell Targ celebrating his 90th birthday. New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.